Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's episode of the Mastering Retention Podcast. Uh, today, we actually have a co-founder with us, which is super exciting, uh, Mr. Lior Hadashian, um, which uh, hopefully I got your name right, but uh, <laughs> yeah. awesome. Um, cool. Well, you know, I've been following you guys at uh, Gavra Games for a while now, um, and you've been doing some, some super exciting stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm really honored to have you on the podcast today and I don't really get to talk to too many founders, so it's going to be super exciting. Um, before we dive in though, I always like to ask, you know, what's your story? Like, how'd you get into games? Well, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for having me here. It's a great honor to be on the podcast. Um, every chance I have, I get, I get to like share my experience and let other game developers, uh, get more driven into doing what they want. So for my side, it's a blessing. Um, how did I get into games? Well, uh, it's actually it's we got into games because, like you said, I'm a co-founder. Uh, we will get into that. Um, but basically, ever since I remember myself, like growing growing up, I was playing video games since the Nintendo Entertainment System, the NES and the Super NES. I always played Warcraft One, Command and Conquer One, like everything. Every day, I came back from school, eating something for lunch, and straight to the computer. Uh, my parents used to uh, like um, have a fight with me, like get off the computer or uh, go study. Well, what will come out of this? Like uh, today, I can say to them, "I'm uh, I'm living if, uh, with video games. <laughs> it's making my living." But uh, yeah, basically, like I always grew up into this. This is what was my passion, and uh, and me and my cousins in uh, pr- plural, we were playing a lot of PlayStation when when we were meeting. And especially yeah. with, an, with one cousin, Shai Shemtov, which is my uh, co-founder. Um, we were playing a lot of games when we grew up. Um, I think like until I was 21, we were still playing video games while all the other cousins uh, continued on with their life. <laughs> and we always like joked or not joked like, hey, well, let's uh, make games some, someday. And we were like, yeah, do sure. And, and when I uh, got uh, discharged from the army, it's not a dishonorable, right? I, I'm not sure how to say it in English. Like, I ended my uh, my service. Yeah, well, I, I think everyone does service in Israel, right? Yeah, it's a mandatory to do mm-hmm. three years. I was in the medical corps, by the way. I um, I was a programmer, <laughs> not, not a medic. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I also did another one uh, one year and a half. Uh, like, in, uh, you, you do the first year for almost free. And after that, you can work for the army. So I kept on working there. Um, and right then when I ended my service, like my cousin Shai came to me, like, let's make games. And I told him, okay, let's do it. <laughs> that was pretty much it. Like uh, my parents really wanted me to go and find another job in the high tech, but um, I saw the Israeli um, state of the gaming in, in, at, the, at the time. Yeah. Uh, I, my, I don't know how to say it in English. My, my eyes got darkened. Like these are the games we make here. Like, there was no passion. Everything was like uh, mm. data driven, super casual, super casual. No real games behind it. And like I want, the, I just told my parents like I can't work in such places. I want, I want to work on actual games. And so this is why we uh, founded Gover Games. Basically, this is how we started. We had no experience in game development. We had, each of us have had experience in programming and Mashai had experience in art and making 3D models and animation, but we didn't come from the industry. Um, so like we learned and we did on the, on the fly. Uh, we had no money. <laughs> we did it like a bootstrap. I was, I was um, gonna ask you about that. Yeah, how how'd that, that work? We didn't, we didn't have money. We got, we had a little savings like, uh, not enough, not enough to uh, have offices or hire someone. And I was like uh, making a, I was a perfect tutor for Unity Engine. This is, I, uh, I was able to pay rent, uh, but we lived especially on um, passion because we loved w- what we were doing and we believed in it. Um, so basically like bootstrap, no money. And we just uh, developed with passion. No, no, even no business plan. Like let's make a game, it will sell. Um, of course, over the year, we learned, we learned a lot. Like uh, after a year, we advanced like barely 20% like where the game was supposed to be. And uh, we understand that we understood like, okay, this isn't going nowhere. We need to find this, a solution. And 
out of the box, like, uh, and also tell me if I'm going uh, off script here. <laughs> and uh, oh, no, no, this, this is great. Yeah. I was, I was going to ask you questions like this anyway, so please continue. Okay. Yeah. So like after a year, we had no money, not enough money. The game did progress. Like out of the blue, um, someone I w- walked with like for two days in my life, I gave him some advices, like cons- consultancy told me, hey, uh, we need you be here at some offices, uh, not far from here, please uh, come help us. I came for a few days and uh, they told me like, okay, come walk with us. I told them, no, I can't. I have my own project. <laughs> this is not something that can happen. And uh, they told me like, oh, no problem. Bring your uh, partner here. Uh, b- b- he can also walk here. Uh, walk here all fine. And in the min- meanwhile, we can talk about investment. And I was like, wow. It's like a, a dream come true. We, we, will, we will be able to have salaries. We'll, we will have an investment. And the offices also told us in the days you're not working on uh, at the place, it was it called Paymax. Like you just can uh, sit here in the offices. It sounded like too good to be true, which uh, almost was. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, after a long, long time, like from the moment we talked about it, like um, it passed nine months since we actually uh, signed the deal of investment, which was, which was a very, very small investment. I'm talking like uh, $40,000, um, which is like nothing, but for a new studio and then indie, it was like amazing. A little something, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, like we, we needed that uh, Kickstarter, like that first investment to, to get things moving. Like if you get an investment, then other will invest, which what happened in doing after that and we'll get to that. But like, it was a very, very long uh, um, process. Like we didn't come from the business side. We didn't know what uh, terms sheet are, like our investments are working. The investor like promised us a lot of things. He said, yeah, we will do, before we with the term sheet, he told us, yeah, ABC, that's it. We got 40 pages of investment, which was uh, like what we talked about, what we got. Uh, it was a lesson for life, by the way. <laughs> uh, it, it's, taught us a lot about investments and investors <laughs> in general. Um, by the way, they are not all the same, but they, they have a typecast. I, I'm not sure if you're an investor or not. I saw something in the LinkedIn. I, I dabble a bit in, in angel investing, but I, I wouldn't mm-hmm. consider myself a professional investor more. I, yeah, I, enjoy, exactly. I enjoy helping founders you know, build cool companies. Exactly. And this is the difference. Like you're an angel and a VC is something like more <laughs> intrusive. Yeah. They want control. They want everything. Like they wanted a lot of control. And we said, at the beginning, we said, okay, 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 okay. But then it came like, it came a phase like the term sheet was too uh, much aggressive. And we told them, okay, we, either you put all these, uh, how do you say, little uh, notes, um, branches, I think. I do you put, yeah. Yeah, the, the a lot of these branches down, or we don't you don't have a deal. Suddenly, the term sheet was halved, and much much was much much better. And uh, we did sign it. It almost fell down, but we did sign it. And uh, we we promised ourselves like years of offices and uh, initial investment, which after we uh, released the game on the early access, the figures was great. Like we sold in the first month, ten thousand copies. And our investor, investor was so happy, like he, he immediately um, activated, he committed his uh, options because in the term sheet, he also uh, saved himself the option to double the investment. Ah. Uh, again, for a very low price, but uh, for us, it was like, hey, somebody believed in us and it was great. Yeah. No, that's cool. This um, is like how we got into the road. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that something that I see a lot of game studios, both brand new and even successful studios struggling with, how do you come up with game ideas? So I'd love to just like hear a little bit about like warriors and maybe we start with like, for people that don't know what it is, can you tell us like mm-hmm. what warriors is about you know, genre gameplay? Yeah, sure. Um, but before warriors, there, there was another game. Which, oh yeah. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah. <laughs> There was another game. I hope, well, let's see if I can send you the uh, the trailer for it. Unfortunately, you can't find it anymore on the Play Store uh, because it's not supported anymore. But here is the trailer. The game called Airspace Defender. Um, if you will watch the trailer, you see like it's very uh, affected by old school games. I think it was it, the game was called Paratrooper. Like you have a cannon 
which can move and shoot and on uh, moving planes which coming from the both sides of the screen. This was like the first game we made. Uh, at the time it, it, it was our baby, it seems amazing. Now I'm looking at, at it and like I'm, today I'm like I'm doing it in one week much better much better like I, I don't know how, 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 how there I thought it's, it's good but it was my baby so in a way it was good. Was this um, a Steam game or a mobile game? Or? No, no, it was a mobile game. Uh, we thought like if you uh, make a game for mobile, you become rich. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but for your question on regarding the, uh, how do you think on a game idea? This was like, I don't know how I got the idea, but a long time before we started to work together, like I, I had this idea in my head, this is a game I want to make. I don't know why. It's just like a bug that just, just won't leave your mind. And um, I was like, I, I did the game, uh, GDD, a game design document, like everything's supposed to appear in the game. My partner, Shai Shemtov, he did like all the art and the 3D models. Um, and this is like specifically for this game, how we got the idea. Um, for the other game we made after that, uh, it's called the Warrior Size to Glory. It's a turn-based gladiator fighting game with RPG elements. It's a little longer description. Uh, but basically, the game is very, very influenced by an old game called the Sword, Sword and Sandals, uh, which apparently a lot more people than I thought, uh, um, a lot more people than the fact that we know it, know it. It's very, very popular, especially in Israel. Um, mm -hmm. And the game was a 2D game on the, in Flash, on the Krongate, I think. And uh, you basically play a warrior, a gladiator, that is. And uh, he starts as level one, you defeat gladiators, and the, all the battles are in turn based. So it's like uh, more tactical, but it's very goofy. The, ga the game itself, I really liked it, but it, it, lacked, it, it, had, it had a lack of depth. Like, it could be a lot more. Like, uh, mm. it was, uh, I'm not sure what to say it, but you got, a, you got a taste for more after you play it. Yeah. Uh, so we were really influenced by the gameplay and wanted to make like a game that's inspired by this by this game by Soul and Sandals. Like everyone who know who sees our game automatically says to us, "Hey, it's like Soul and Sandals." Um, now a lot of people told us over the time that our game mimics uh, Soul and Sandals, which I think at the beginning was, I'm afraid it was true at the beginning. Like the the lines were too blurry, but. As the time progressed, we really took the game into another, to another direction, like to make it our own, uh, especially when we um, added the multiplayer later on, which mm -hmm. something wasn't in the Sony standards, at least I know of. Um, it was really like another game on its own. Um, in such a way that if you really go to the main page in Steam, you will see we have a bundle with uh, Sony Sandals. So, we actually got the <laughs> approval and blessing of the original creator. So, wow. yeah, we got a, we got from a place where we were like mimics to similar to um, we live in the same genre, but we are not uh, like um, stealing the idea because we actually have the approval. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so, okay, so you kind of expanded from there. Um, did you guys do any sort of, I don't know, like customer interviews or like talking to people that loved sword and sandals to understand like what they liked or what they were missing? Or was this all mostly just kind of based on your guys' experience and what you felt was missing? Um, on retrospective, we should have done it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> like I said, we didn't do it at the business plan. We didn't exactly know what we were doing. We're just like passionate and doing, uh, doing what we love. Uh, so no, we just started developing it on our feelings instead of making a survey and asking players. Only after I think almost one year of development, we came to uh, cons in Israel. Like we came with a laptop and uh, um, a laptop, some very very cheap costume. Like uh, come play this game, and uh, only then we started getting some surveys, feedback, and then we understood that the game is nowhere really near release. Um, so no, we did it after we started developing, which was a mistake. But today we will do like a customer survey, like check out the, the field, I, how we said, and uh, even after two, three months of development, like release something to not, not, not to be afraid. 
in these times, like people are, not, uh, people are very afraid to show what they have. And they're getting input very, very um, late in, in the development uh, process. This is what happened to us. Like, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be afraid, like after two, three months, even if the game doesn't look so good, release it and get some feedback. Yeah, no, that's, that's great advice. I, I completely agree with that. Um, did you ever use anything like a, a play test cloud or any of those like testing services where you get to watch the videos of the people playing your game? Um, no, actually, well, we are very old school. And uh, like I said, we actually came to cons and watched people playing. Yeah. Uh, when we gave out betas for the for home releases, like they had a survey to fill out. Uh, then mostly today we are talking with our uh, community at Discord. Like most of the time they share the screen if they want to show me a bug. Um, sometimes they just send us a video. And mostly we are talking with the players themselves. Um, we're not doing like the asynchronous uh, testing. Like they get something that we follow their we watch their pattern and how they play it, and then they send it back to us. Um, maybe it's working, but not, not, this is not the way we are working. <laughs> yeah, no, that's cool. Um, I did see one thing that you guys, you know, kind of talked about your website of creating cross-platform games and stuff. Like, you're on Steam right now with Warriors. Is that something you're intending to take cross-platform? Are you going to go mobile? Are you going to go you know, Xbox, PS4, or five, um, sorry, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. I, I still don't have the PlayStation 5. I still got the, the full one. <laughs> I don't have time to play it. Um, yeah, uh, this is what the, our initial plan, like to become a, multi, a cross-platform uh, company, like the website from two or three years ago. And um, we, the plan was to release it on Steam, fully release it and then go to mobile. Um, the, the, I'm not sure this is the plan now. I'm saying I'm not sure because it's still on the up on the table, but we're not running towards it. Like uh, this is not, I'm, I'm not sure this is the first thing we're going to do at the moment. Uh, but we, this was the plan. We do, we, we do want to make games for mobile and the uh, consoles. Like if we will find a publisher who can help us get the consoles, it will happen. But um, not at the moment. That's it. I'm not, we, we can't promise anything right now. Yeah. Because, because like, after <laughs> we, we um, jumped to the water, like, we talked with a lot of experts in the mobile field. We, underst we understood we are not, that, we still don't know anything about the mobile. Uh, and maybe sometimes saying in PC and consoles, which is also cross platforms. Um, can be better like staying in the in the comfort zone or in your expertise zone. Yeah. Um, well, here's a question. Um, are you guys doing any sort of live ops type stuff with uh, Warriors? Are you, you know, running weekly events or special offers? Like I know it's a, a purchase game. <laughs> Do you have you yeah, know, you a purchase there? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, well, what does that look like in terms of like game support and operations and stuff? Or is it pretty much like the game is done and it just kind of lives there? Um, we, we mostly have like, like activities on the Discord page. Like we have giveaways and we have some ways to um, participate with the community. Uh, in terms of live ops, we did have plans like double XP weekend and things like that. But um, not at the moment. No, we don't have that much of a live ops. Like you said, it's a purchase game. Um, the closest thing we, we have to that, it's the daily quest. You get every, every day a new quest, uh, two quests, which can give you rewards and cosmetic rewards. And um, also you have like the leaderboard uh, rewards, like every day, uh, depending on your um, ranking in the leaderboards, you will get like another chest. Um, chest will, which uh, is filled with rewards like in-game money, cosmetic money, and things that will help you progress uh, even more. But uh, this is uh, as far as live, live ops we have currently in the game. That's of cool. course, if you will go to mobile, like this is like <laughs> the things like 
like the the things are different on pc and mobile like this is this is exactly why why i'm thinking we are not that ready for mobile and we, the game we will will need a lot of adaptation to go to mobile yeah no i feel that i mean so here's a here's a question and i'm curious what your take on this so uh you've got warriors out it's uh it seems like it's doing pretty well right um are you guys kind of trying to double down on this game, make it better, sell more, expand cross platform, or, you know, are you to the point where you're starting to think about maybe another game altogether or how do you balance that? Yeah, uh, exactly. Like, like I said before, like we were not sure which is the next platform we're going to attack. Like it, 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 back then we were sure like, oh yeah, releasing it and then go to mobile. But mobile is very, very um, risky in terms of investment against uh, what you can get, receive. Uh, so we, we actually, like, like I said, we, if a publisher will come, we will definitely go to uh, consoles. Um, but currently, we just signed, the, we signed a new uh, cooperation. Unfortunately, I can't uh, publicly announce it yet. Uh, I think by the time it will be like, uh, it will be the postcard. The episode will be aired. I'm sure it will be, but I can't take any chances by by <laughs> uh, by contract. I can't say it at the moment. Um, but it's still on this game. Like it's an expansion to this game with this, um, some kind of technical technical technological service. That's it. Um, but uh, yeah, um, definitely after that, a new game is on the horizon. Um, it's it's it, it, it's. Like all the options are on the table and none of them like having a clear direction, but uh, a new game is definitely on the, on the table. Very cool. Very cool. So if there's a new game on the table, <laughs> what's, uh, <laughs> what's your process for evaluating what that new game is? Or I guess, what have you learned and, and what are you planning to do differently on kind of your next game from what you did on say Warriors? Uh, yeah, first of all, much, much better planning. Like, I understood the audience a lot more. Like, we didn't really know what, how big is the audience. Uh, are they satisfied? Or did they need another way Gladiators game? Uh, we just, like, went with the passion. So, first of all, um, check out the target audience. Uh, check out our competitors um, to see if we can do it. If, if maybe someone is doing it much better than us. Um, Having uh, like evaluating the time a lot better now that I understand that better the process of making a game from A to Z. Um, so this is another thing like understand cost, understand options, where we can find investors, where we can find publishers. Is it is there even publisher for the type of game we want to make? Let's say we want to make an RTS with teddy bears fighting unicorns. We need to check if if there are publishers who can take some, such a thing. Um, this is why um, for Warriors, uh, that's it. Uh, we don't have a publisher. No, no publisher wanted to deal with this genre of games because it's a niche in, in the end. So like we will choose a game which is not that uh, popular, a game genre which is not, not that popular, but not uh, a niche, not in, totally indie, if you understand. Yeah. That's interesting. So let's say, you know, me and you were to start a studio today and we want to emulate this sort of kind of niche approach, which I think is actually a, a cool approach. Like if I was to do that, I would prefer to have maybe like five or 10 of these kind of niche games <laughs> that's generating like a stable boost line of revenue. How do you find a niche and how do you figure out that it's going to be viable before you spend a lot of time and energy on it? Uh, usually it's com it's coming from home like uh, it's it's a game you love it's something you're playing on yourself like I have, I have a philosophy don't make a game which you won't be won't be playing by your by your home like uh, don't make a slot machine if you're not a slot machine player <laughs> I'm going for the the edge case um, but uh, usually one of one of the founders or someone from the team will come from the uh, f Will, will arrive with a niche which is which is familiar to him, which is which he plays by himself. Yeah. So basically, 
play a lot of games and maybe a lot of different games, maybe even outside of your typical triple a you know big game kind of style like try to get into more like different indies and you know off the path uh type uh, games yeah, if you're yeah. looking for a niche but it it needs to come from you it, it needs to be real don't play games for the sake of marketing research um go play the games you love and make and make from them a game you want to make uh you can be you can be influenced by triple a it's okay but Take into consideration you will make like five percent of this game, not the uh, sixty or seventy like a lot of people I which I know uh, just starting to the, to learn uh, game development are coming to me like, "Hey, I want to make an MMORPG. Uh, and I'm like, "Don't <laughs> yeah i uh I really love Skyrim, and uh i'm I've done some pretty decent like unity like machine. generated uh graphics and stuff that actually get like get pretty on par to a skyrim like world but uh it's a a far cry from actually creating a a real skyrim with you know all the voice acting and the stories and all that yeah. kind of stuff there's just so much that goes into it exactly. so is there a certain factor of you know additional time that you need to have in based on changes based on community feedback and like how to orient it and plan a game like hey this is the game that i want to build and it's warriors like how long realistically should i be planning to spend building a game like that um hmm. okay at the time we thought like we'll make the whole game in about two years uh In the end, it took us five years, <laughs> a lot of uh, le- learning curve. Um, but we, it was important to us like, to finish the game. Like, we said, no, no, no matter what, this game see the, the light of uh, day, and it will get all the things that we, that we promised for our game, gamers. Uh, unfortunately, the, the girls didn't make the cut. They were supposed to be like female warriors, but uh, they didn't make it to the, into the cut, maybe in the future. But um, coming, back to, coming back to your question, like um, to, if uh, I, would, I would need to like make a timetable for a development of in such a scale today, I will have like a lot of uh, blanks in it, like iterations. Like, like I said, two, three, six months to get a POC, send it. Then put blank in the timetable for unknown changes you will get from the community. And then again, iteration changes, iteration changes, and everything like you have in mind that will take like, let's say two weeks, make it fall, <laughs> because uh, things tend, tend to get a lot more, uh, a lot longer than you think. People think they have a lot of time in their, in their life, but they don't, because life happens, things happen. Like people always tell me, yeah, I will make a game on my spare time while working uh, in a full-time job. I tell them you can't uh, because in their head they will have every evening to develop the game but I'm sorry you will have sick days you will have weddings you will have life you will want to rest you want every every evening like you say and um, besides this like off topic to your question like I really believe like in dedication like if you're doing something do it properly do it with a lot of focus and devotion uh, don't do it on the side in a spare time because you Uh, from my experience you can sit on a bag on you know, one bug like uh, all day mm. so <laughs> you can't really advance anywhere so take a lot of time kilo kilo I, I took a word in the Hebrew like every, everything you think that will take you two weeks double it at the worst yeah. case it will take less you will have a lot of uh, bonus like uh, bonus tasks to add into the game yeah do you think you Like if you could redo warriors today um, would you release it into like an early access pay for access let's say like six months in even if it's just like a slice of the game and like just a beginning hmm. um, it's, 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 a, it's a huge debate like when it's enough to get into early access um, I think we could have the- No, uh, we went to early access, I think, uh, on the right uh, time, um, because there wasn't that much of a meet. Like, today you get 
four times what we what we add in the first time we had early access. Um, but today I think it will take us like six months, even less, to get to the point we were after two years at a time. So I would say like don't wait too much. Like if your game is on early access and it's almost complete, it's really really done and doesn't have a lot of play of um, places to change so you don't have anything to do in early access but if your early access is too early you don't have anything to work with it's like uh, it's a really hard question it's like what what, what a comedy is what what is a funny thing you can explain you can't explain when a stand-up is ready to be performed when a, a a joke is ready to be heard like you need to feel it you need to test it and yeah. I think it's it's things you get by experience. Like, and I I will say something like this: make mistakes. Like, release your game too early, release your game too late, but release it. <laughs> like, uh, like uh, Shia LaBeouf, just do it. Wise words, wise words. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay. So you talked about games in Israel when you were getting started and how they were maybe too data-driven and too casual and whatnot. Do you or have you used any sort of like data-driven approach? Like, do you guys have analytic systems within Warriors to see like, hey, these characters are too powerful or X, Y, Z is happening and we need to like change that or balance that or whatnot? Um, definitely, yeah, we have analytics, um, especially if to make the game better, like understand where people are, like if something is uh, is too over overpowered, something is underpowered, um, especially things like that, yeah. Um, we don't uh, follow the user, of course, we, all, we are um, going after the GTPR policies and there is no intrusion to the privacy, I must uh, uh, say that. Um, but what I meant by data driven companies like in Israel, most companies um, don't, don't, I don't want to say they don't care, but they don't put a lot of focus on the game itself. The game is there to present something and to get input. Like most of the, most of their work is done on the behind the scenes on the backend, like when to show a message, when to uh, give you some more rewards. It's like, they're looking at the stat statistics rather than to see if people enjoy the game. Um, and in our case, it's the, it's backwards. Like the analytics is there to make the game become better. Like if someone, uh, let's say, does if a lot of people are dropping at level three fights, it means something in the difficulty curve is not right. So we need to adjust it. And uh, we did we did we did a lot of it, especially in the, in the single player. But uh, I think in the multiplayer we had a lot of a lot more of community to work with. So we had like real people to talk with rather than uh, working with numbers. Yeah. Do you ever find that what people are saying doesn't correlate with the numbers? Like as an example, <clears throat> and I, I heard this from somebody at Supercell before where the Clash Royale audience, everyone hated the Royal Giant. And even after they like changed the giant to nerf them or change them a little bit. People still hated them and thought they were way too powerful and whatnot. Um, but Supercell, when they looked at the, the win rates and the actual data and stuff, like Royal Giant really was one of the, like the least powerful cards that was out there. Um, so how do you, you know, have you ever had a scenario come up like that? And, and how do you handle that? Uh, okay, yeah, definitely with scenarios like that. I can give an example like uh, when we first added the, the cosmetics in cosmetics as purchasable in the game. Like a lot of people said, you don't get enough um, coins, cosmetic coins to buy uh, things. Um, but of course, everybody would say that. Like everyone wants to get a lot more <laughs> cosmetic coins, and preferably they don't want to pay anything for the for the cosmetics. Yeah. So like this is the a place that there was no correlation like people earned and worked out to re receive the cosmetic coins but of course they wanted to work less out so sometimes you need to understand when to receive the feedback and to dismiss it um mm. like exactly but if if everyone is saying like it's too hard to receive cosmetic coins and we would have seen that nobody's purchasing any cosmetics then 
it's something to to, to to consider. Yeah, that makes sense. So here's more of an implementation type question. Um, do you have any tips or tricks or like, what is the right way to add analytics into your game so that it's actually useful? So maybe an example of how I've seen this done that becomes less useful versus more useful. Um, let's pretend I'm adding analytics into Candy Crush. And I could, on the one hand, make a event that is triggered for every single level that you complete, like level one completed, level two completed, up to level 4,000 or wherever they're at now. Um, or, you know, I could make a event that is like a level complete event and you could add data onto that where the level was one, two, three, or a booster was used two or something. I feel like analyzing the data of which levels are completed and whatnot is gonna be far easier if you can group them just based on the single level complete event versus, you know, an, an event per every single level that's out there. Um, I'm curious, like, do you have any experience or thoughts on the right way to put tracking here and here? Are there some things that maybe is too much work to track? Um, unfortunately, there is no one answer to this thing. Like uh, every game is its own uh, methods and uh, analytics approach. Uh, I do think like there is no, no such thing as, okay, there is such thing as too much information, but there is a lot of information which is very useful. Um, I think the main power of analytics is coming like when you intersect, like the more, um, let's say Candy Crush, the more you have like, um, okay, how much time, how much time did I take to um, finish level 28, let's say, and compare it with my total play time. Um, so as long as I, as I have the number of tries and the number of time I set on one level and I have the total play time and I have uh, another metric, as long as I have all the metrics and I can intersect them and play with them as, as I want, this is crucial. This is like the, the goal of analytics, like the intersection, uh, if you understood what I meant. But unfortunately, there is no, like I said, there is no right way. I, I can just like, oh yeah, for Candy Crush, we'll do this and this and this. We need to see the game, we need to, to understand how it's built, but always think ahead and before you're doing the game, like, where to implement the analytics. Like this is another thing I take from the development of Warriors uh, to think about it pre, pre, pre ahead of development. Yeah. So here's maybe something that I think about here. In my general experience, it is easier or at least better to start with a question rather than start with the data. Like whenever I'm like, oh, I'm just gonna like, look at some data and find some insights and stuff. I usually don't end up finding insights. Rather, if I come in and I come up with a hypothesis, like, um, uh, I don't know, let's say, I, I think that Garen is too powerful of a champion in League of Legends. Um, you know, does his spin do too much damage or something like that. I, like I start with a question, then I can go to the particular data and try to use that to answer the question. I find that that works better for me. Um, but, you know, do you need to, I guess, beforehand, like I might have that question, but if I haven't been recording the spin damage or, or whatever is actually happening in the game, I might not actually have that data there. So is there a balancing act where you need to, before you start implementing the, the analytics, where you need to go through and try to think about what are the types of questions that I might want to ask as my game's going on? It's like a little bit of both. Like, um, let me get to the, my answer in my head. Um, Let's say, like, like you said, you have a weapon, you have a damage system, and everything like this. It's something very trivial, like to add the, the, these numbers, like, okay, we can we go back? I'm not sure I understand the question. So, okay, maybe here's, here's a better question. Okay. As you've been, you know, working on Warriors or, um, or any other games, I guess, you know, have you ever 
wanted to answer something but not been able to because that data wasn't being collected at that point in time? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, it happened us a lot. Um, like sometimes we wanted to understand, like, yeah, if if the weapon is too overpowered, hey, we don't know if it's too overpowered. We don't have this analytics, like, um, if a battle happened with a specific uh, sword, did they win? Did they lose? Like how it affected the, the outcome? Um, so you need to be agile. Like you need, hey, we don't need this analytics. Okay, let's do it for the next patch. Um, maybe it's the indie way, but uh, we, we were uh, we were and we are still are very agile. That's very cool. Okay, so it's almost like a continual improvement process where you try to get it close yeah. enough, but yeah. don't spend too much time. Uh, yeah, I can't like uh, guess all the information I will need. Some of it I will see on, on uh, while trying, but of course, again, if we will go to do another game. I'm sure that I will make all the all the trivial the implementation of the analytics like damage, like win loss, like whoever lost, what happened to him, whoever won, like what happened to him, and to understand if there is a definitely a better way to win in in the game. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, have you guys added any new content to Warriors? I'm I'm curious how you think about, you know, that process. Like, you know, obviously at some point in time, even the the most interesting game is going to become fairly predictable and and probably a little bit boring unless you're adding new stuff. Like you talked about adding maybe female warriors, like, you know, mm -hmm. let's say you decide to add an Amazon DLC package or something like that. Like what's your approach to thinking about keeping your game fresh and adding new content and stuff so your players don't get bored? Um well, for it, okay, the, it's, the game was in, in production, let's say. It was in development in early access, that is. It, it was in early access for the last three years, I think even four. Um, so we actually like, I'm not sure if to call it like extra content or content that was supposed to be there because it's a game in beta. And we were like every month for two months, we were adding a lot of content because the game was still in development. Um, so p p players already had something to look for. They always they always um, ask for the next next thing, um, and th this is like the bonuses of being on early access. Like players are asking for something, and sometimes we obliged. Like there were things we didn't plan to add to the game, um, and people asked like uh, bosses in the multiplayer. At the beginning, there wasn't supposed to be there, and they asked, and we added. Um, outset, outset mode, let's say, that's it, in the single player. Um, so the game always released, uh, always got the released uh, content. And in last February, the game uh, was released in 1.0, but uh, we still added like more content. Um, the major content page, last major one, was released on the 27th of April. You can see it in the store page. And it, and it added the last boss, which uh, wasn't in the full release because uh, it, 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 it was ready, but it wasn't like uh, in our standard, good enough to be released. So we released it later on with a lot of things like we added controller support and more servers and better leaderboard prices. So we like, even after the game was done, we added a little more things that they asked for. And like I said before, we are going to release something very big for the game, which is it. it Technolo technological change, and uh, I, I hope, uh, but uh, I hope that at the time I will be I will be able to share what it is, but uh, currently I can't. But you, you got the first sneak peek. Mysteries, I love mysteries. Yeah, you see, this is also a way to <laughs> to keep players like uh, uh, waiting for the next thing. They don't know what it is, but it's something good. I love it. I love it. Um, cool stuff. Uh, okay, here's a bit of more of a, a co-founder type question. So I think a lot of people that worked in games today are all, you know, everyone kind of secretly has this idea of starting their studio and having full creative freedom to, you know, create whatever games they want. Um, do you have any like thoughts or lessons um, that you've learned about how to pick a co-founder? Uh, okay, yeah, definitely. For me, it was easy. <laughs> it was my cousin. I knew him my, my whole life. Like, 
it, it, he, he wasn't a stranger. So uh, a lot of people like I envy me, like, oh, uh, you got a co-founder, uh, it's so easy. Like, yeah, I, I got lucky. Uh, but yeah, first of all, it, it, it needs to be somebody you know, not like uh, your best friend, uh, but also not a total stranger, like, hey, let's make a startup tomorrow. Um, you, need, you need someone, like I said, you know, at least in the expertise way, like, you know, it's, he's, a cool, he's a colleague, which uh, you heard about, he's done some great things, like things like that. Um, people with reputation. I don't say like people are the best at the game, but at least people who are known, people who are known for their attitude. It's more impo- important than their expertise and the knowledge. Like if they're, if, uh, if they're dependable, what, what did, they, did you hear about them? Um, and uh, check if they are uh, trustworthy because uh, I know a lot of startups and games which uh, stop development because of, because of the co-founders. Uh, they didn't like, uh, they didn't manage with each other, not sure to say it. Like uh, they split it up. And it's very, very sad to hear, to hear and see, like, especially with games that look very promising. Uh, so I, I like, if I can give a tip, it's like mingle more, make yourself a name, um, be active socially, especially with the indie the developers and the local industry or the global industry. Do you think there's any sort of conversations that would be important to have, you know, before you start, like, you know, I, I feel like I could see a case where you might have started with some other guy or gal and got two years into the game where you thought you were going to release it. And then, oh, I didn't sign on for three more years of this or, you know, where they might get away or are there other, you know, issues that might come down the line where there could be issues like uh, potential exit, like, where are we trying to go with this? Almost like, you know, you're getting married and having that religious or yeah. uh, uh, political type conversations that nobody really wants to have, but you kind of need to hash that out before you, you know, tie the knot. People need to know that uh, working with someone, like co-founding something, it's some kind of a marriage, like it's a, it's a relationship. It's need to be like um, maintained. It's need to be taken care of. It takes time, it takes focus. There are fights, it's unavoidable. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I lost my, uh, my f- f- thinking. Yeah, I guess, you know, are there any particular questions that you think would be pertinent that people should, you know, talk through before oh, they okay. officially tie the knot? Yeah, 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 definitely. Like, uh, first of all, understand the prior experience. Um, if they work with someone else, ask them, how was the experience? Um, and most importantly, do something small at the beginning, like like I did with Shai. We did a very small game for the mobile to understand to understand how we are working together before that. Don't dive into a very big project. Don't do the next MMORPG. Um, think like that. But um, like you're sitting sitting on a date with somebody before you marrying her, sit sit on a date on a, on a coffee with a with a potential co-founder. Uh, and I and, and I will also add this, like like you said, after two years, you're like, okay, this is too much. I can't handle, handle this anymore. I want to go to go out. You need to have like exit points. You need to have uh, first of all, and uh, it's called the founders agreement. Like what happens when someone leaving? And um, always work with terms. Always work with agreements and contracts. It will um, save you a lot, a lot of trouble and headaches in the in the future. Make everything like uh, very neat, very ordered. Always have a place to live. Of course, living it's not uh, um, optimal. It's not good, especially when let's say the lead developer leaves. Uh, but you need to ask yourself why is the uh, lead developer living? <laughs> let's say, um, and this is also the risks of co-founding. Like, yeah, it, it can fall from so many reasons. No money, no investors, bad investors. Um, co-founders not uh, managing what we, one with another, uh, missing the timelines, working too slow, working too hard. It's like it's need to be perfect. <laughs> uh, there, there, are, there are just too much par- parameters for a startup to to, <laughs> to to work. But when it is working, it's like a miracle. I love it. Well, cool. I do have 
one more question because we are on the Mastering Retention podcast, of course. Yeah. Um, and that is, you know, what's one tip or trick or lesson you've learned over the years to increase player retention? Or how do you keep your players playing your game for longer? Uh, yeah, like I said, we have the daily quest. It's something like keeping players to look forward for the next play session. Like every quest is different from the, from the one they got before that. Um, you want to get higher in the ranks in the leaderboard because every day at eight o'clock in the uh, in Israel time you get a chest, something to look forward to. Another thing, um, always promise something, uh, another content okay, which which is uh, coming. Like we released the the fourth boss, which was after the, the release. We announced it before that. Like hey, there is something to look forward to. Um, and I will say that don't be too harsh, don't be too aggressive with the with how you try to maintain players. Players don't like it, especially on PC. If you like do some shady tactics, like um, if you, you will give you will, you will let someone become stronger. If you log in every day, and you will match him against someone who didn't log in every day, it it won't be fair. Like players will understand that. Players will see that. Players are not dumb. Be, be respectful and honor your uh, players. And don't be too too much pushy. Like, come to them, like I said, with the rewards and reason to come, not don't push them to come. Like, I know a lot of games, it's happening, especially on mobile, you get so much notifications. And while you're playing, there is like so much pop-ups. Like, let, let, let people play. Yeah, that's great. Well, cool. I, I think we're about out of time here, though, but uh, thank you so much for joining me today. I had a, a lot of fun, um, and hopefully we can maybe have you come back sometime. Um, yeah, first of all, I really enjoyed the, the time just fl flew by. <laughs> you didn't, I can't believe it was an hour. Yeah. Uh, it, it was really nice to be on this podcast. Uh, it was great having you having me. Um, I, ju I just want to add one last thing, which is kind of a motto, let's say, the philosophy. Yeah. Um, think if you are making games to make money or you're making money to make games. It's like a food for thought. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much, Tom.